Manman, in the form of a blue spirit, appeared bewildered as it materialized beside a jade serpent. Bai Luochen assured everyone that everything would be all right. Cheng Xiaoliu speculated whether her boss had transformed into a blue spirit, due to the serpent. Xiling marveled at the sight of a soul leaving the body without harm to the physical form. Bai Luochen then introduced the serpent as Qing Po, explaining that it could consume the souls of others to enhance its own cultivation. Qing Po's soul power was indistinguishable from that of any living being and could be utilized to nourish Manmen's soul in the future. However, Bai Luochen was concerned that waiting might be challenging for Manmen. Despite Manmen being fine with it, as she could see everyone making efforts on her behalf, she struggled to adapt to her current body. Su Liyue then inquired with Bai Luochen about the possibility of Manmen returning to her original body. Bai Luochen explained that after rebuilding her meridians, Manman's soul had separated, but due to being fused with the corpse for an extended period, it was incompatible with her current living body. He mentioned that even with the use of Qing Po, it would take at least a hundred years to nourish her soul. Mi Meng reassured them, saying that cultivation in the realm of immortals had no time constraints, and a hundred years would pass quickly. Pai Luochen was worried that during the wait, even Wu Zai might become an immortal. He thought it would take a long time and suggested coming up with ideas to speed up the process. Zeling mentioned hearing about a soul palace in the demon realm, related to soul repairing. Despite the potential difficulties, Bai Luochen decided to go to the demon realm and gather some treasures on the way. He then told Nalan Duoduo, Zi Ling, and Chang Xiao Liu to join him. Additionally, he instructed Mi Meng and Su Liyue to stay with Manmen and Wu Zai. Although Su Liyue wanted to go with him, Bai Luochen reminded her that she should be by Manmen's side. Manmen then asked Su Liyue to stay with her, and Su Liyue eventually agreed. Shortly after, Bai Luochen and the girls ventured outside. However, Nalan Duoduo felt uneasy, fearing she might be a burden due to her lower cultivation level. Bai Luochen reassured her, but Chang Xiao Liu intervened, assuring that she would provide cover. Chang Xiao Liu shared a past experience of driving away a demon a decade ago. Bai Luochen cautioned them against being careless. Meanwhile, as Nalan Duoduo and Chang Xiao Liu bonded, Li Xing questioned why Nalan Duoduo, not being a member of the Azure Bird Peak, was joining them. Suddenly, Bai Luochen's flying boat arrived, and they were all whisked away. Their destination, the Bei Yuan Sea on the south border. Meanwhile, at Ching Hong Academy's Broken Sword Cave, a man cultivated on a throne made of swords. His eyes opened when he received a report that the Demon Lord was on the verge of revival. The shadowy figure couldn't believe that the man was leisurely hiding while such a critical event was unfolding. Chen Yihei, a former instructor at the Peak of Fusion, insisted that it was his duty as the Sharp Sword to protect the Immortal Alliance. However, the shadowy figure was more concerned about Chen Yihei sitting on the swords and potentially hurting himself. Chen Yihei stood up and explained that merging with the sword was his method of cultivation. Did the sword just, um, come out from there? Chen Yihei, curious about the visit, inquired further. The shadowy figure revealed that Qing Shi had been exposed, and people from the academy were headed to the Bei Yuan Sea. Chen Yihei asked about the department involved, and learned it was the talisman department. He expressed disappointment upon discovering that it was the seemingly weaker Bai Luochen. It seemed that the dean had once again forgotten to spread the news about Bai Luochen. Later at Bei Yuan, Nalan Duoduo asked Bai Luochen about the outfit she had on, wondering if it was a swimsuit. Chang Xiaoliu wasn't happy with the swimsuit's lack of defense, and suggested using a water avoidance technique instead. Bai Luochen explained that the demonic energy in the sea could erode spiritual energy. He reassured her that the swimsuits were made with dragon skin. Then, Bai Luochen urged Zi Ling to stop delaying. Zi Ling felt extremely embarrassed in her revealing swimsuit and worried about never getting married. Bai Luochen insisted that it suited her, making Zi Ling feel flustered. As she tried to comment on Bai Luochen's attire, Chang Xiaoliu interrupted and told her to get into the water. Bai Luochen and the girls submerged underwater while a man in a diving suit monitored them. He reported to his captain that the mechanism was set up. A shadowy figure then plotted to prevent the intruders from resurfacing. Bai Luochen had quickly reached the seal and found that it had already started to degrade. Seeing that it could corrupt up to 80% of the spiritual energy around it, he thought it was the worst situation. Using telepathy, Chang Xiaoliu asked what they could do with the talismans since the spiritual power was unusable. Bai Luochen then questioned Zi Ling if she had heard anything about the demonic world during her time in the Soul Sect. She mentioned that the demonic world was busy preparing something significant. Cheng Xiaoliu confirmed that she couldn't gather spiritual energy anymore, unlike a thousand years ago when she visited the same ocean. 
Bai Luochen explained that the ocean was already polluted, and stated that only talismans and magic tools with stored spiritual energies would work. Chang Xiaoli had been wondering about the events of the last thousand years while she was isolated with Man Man. Bai Luochen then explained that the human world and demonic world had been separated two years ago. However, an island country had opened a special rift, despite protests. Due to their negligence, the spatial cracks had gone out of control. Consequently, the ocean became polluted, giving birth to strange mutant monsters. Brother Fish had more muscle than me. Feeling frustrated, Chang Xiaoli decided to eliminate those responsible for opening the spatial rifts, but Bai Luochen claimed she was too late. The island country had already been destroyed by experts, leaving the Bei Yuan Ocean as its remnants. Bai Luochen had told the girls to use earpieces that resembled wireless headphones to communicate with each other. Their mission was to venture into the demonic world and lift the four restrictions on the passage. They were assigned specific locations to visit. As Bai Luochen, Chang Xiaolu, Nalan Duoduo, and Li Xing approached the restrictions, a sudden attack targeted Li Xing. Bai Luochen was puzzled, and before he could understand what was happening, Chang Xiaolu and Nalan Duoduo also fell victim to the mysterious force. It was then that Bai Luochen noticed a sea monster, a Castanea larva, at the tribulation stage. Recognizing the threat, he decided to take action. Chang Xiaolu mentioned her spiritual power was being drained, urging Bai Luochen to intervene. Bai Luochen had activated a talisman formation named Space Creation. He destroyed the tentacles that were gripping Nalan Duoduo and Li Xing. He instructed Chang Xiaoliu, the demon ancestor, to find her own way out. Bai Luochen was surprised that the rabbit demon couldn't handle a simple monster at the tribulation stage. Chang Xiaoliu, frustrated, burst out of the tentacle herself, reverting to her original form that she hadn't used since staying with Manmen. She then demanded Bai Luochen to take responsibility for the situation. Chang Xiaoliu glared at the monster and leaped towards it, revealing her meteorite pestle disguised as a hairpin. She used the large rod to strike the monster, causing the rabbit demon to laugh manically as the dying creature sank to the sea floor. Nalan Duoduo questioned if Chang Xiaoliu had won, but Bai Luochen insisted that they were only just beginning. Meanwhile, a mysterious figure observed the unfolding events. This figure, known as the Envoy, was overseeing everything. When asked by a subordinate whether they should assist the Ocean Lord, the Envoy decided against intervening. They believed that the Ocean Lord's wrath would soon be unleashed, with Bai Luoshen and the others becoming the Ocean Lord's prey. Suddenly the seafloor began to shake, and Chang Xiaoyu realized that the monster was revealing its true form. Emerging from the seafloor, it took on the appearance of a colossal Cthulhu-like creature. Recognizing the impending battle, Chang Xiaoyu transformed into her true self and delivered a powerful uppercut, propelling the monster out of the ocean. In her giant form, Chang Xiaoyu continued to engage the monster. Concerned about the worsening situation, the envoy and their subordinate started to worry. The envoy instructed their subordinate to contact Chen Yihe. At the academy, Chen Yihe swiftly received the message and ordered the deployment of the East Wind Sword. Flying off, they praised the Demon Lord. Meanwhile, Bai Luochen urged Chang Xiaoliu to hasten her efforts, as the portal was almost stabilized. In the demon world, a demon maid noticed unusual activity in the skies. Interpreting the rumbling as a sign of imminent rain, she remained unaware of the extraordinary events taking place. When the East Wind Sword arrived, the messenger praised his lord once more, and the sea erupted as if hit by a nuclear blast. In the emptiness, Bai Luochen felt his spiritual energy shield weakening. He directed the system to adjust the course and target the demon world instead. Recognizing the appearance of the Immortal Alliance's treasure, Bai Luochen understood that someone was collaborating with the demons. Nalan Duoduo anxiously searched for Bai Luochen, but he assured his disciple not to worry as he was working on a solution. Just as the system finished correcting the course, the portal began to open. Bai Luochen's puppet appeared beside Nalan Duoduo, instructing her to protect herself as they would be separated upon reaching the demon world. Meanwhile, Zeling was already distressed and tearful, fearing she would die young. On another front, Chang Xiaoliu continued to battle the tentacles. As the quartet entered the portal, Bai Luochen cautioned the girls to be vigilant. In a demon town, a bright light suddenly appeared in a warehouse revealing Bai Luochen. Wanting to blend in, he attempted to use a disguise, but his spiritual energy was too low. Trying to contact the girls through puppets failed. Fortunately, they should be almost completely safe as they had his puppets. Bai Luochen regretted not making one for himself. Out of the blue, his spiritual energy transformed into demonic energy, and he grew a small horn, which was considered average.
Exiting the warehouse, the system installed a demon language module. He overheard demons searching for someone, and another individual sought laborers, disappointed that the strong ones had been conscripted by the military. Noticing Bai Luochen, who claimed to be seeking a job, the man doubted him due to the absence of a tail and pointed ears, as well as his shabby appearance. Pai Luochen questioned if his disguise had failed, but he was still accepted and instructed to enter the carriage. He wondered why the demons were so agitated. In the carriage, Bai Luochen met a friendly two-horned demon named David and introduced himself. David found his name weird, and Bai Luochen explained that he came from the Far East. Bai Luochen then asked why the other workers had a gloomy demeanor, and David couldn't believe he didn't know what would happen when working for a noble. David claimed that demons like them were no different from slaves, and angering a black demon lord could lead to death. Bai Luochen was surprised by the racism, and mentioned that in his hometown skin color didn't matter. Assuming it was a cultural difference, David explained the common beliefs in the western regions. He clarified that the black goat race could master magic, while the white demon race had no affinity with magic at all. The black demons achieved greatness in the last war, becoming nobles, while the low-born white demons were treated as slaves and expendables. After Bai Luochen heard about how awful the place was, he couldn't understand why David was so eager to work under a noble. David insisted it was because of love. He had fallen for the young lady of the Wilton Duke's house. He passionately declared that his heart had already been claimed by her. However, Bai Luochen became concerned for David's safety, given the grim reputation of the place. David then glanced at Bai Luochen and expressed regret over having a small horn, something generally considered unattractive for most demons. The carriage then began to move. Shortly after, the workers and Bai Luochen reached the Wilton mansion, following the orders of another demon. Bai Luochen felt something and quickly grabbed the whip, threatening to harm the demon. Startled by the strength of the white demon, the demon urged Bai Luochen to start working. The workers gathered and David called Bai Luochen over. Bai Luochen wondered about the line they were forming, and David explained that a stewardess was evaluating their magical abilities. Job assignments would be based on their magic levels, with only those above level 7 allowed to work inside the mansion. The steward, Gladiette, expressed disappointment in the low quality of the current batch, as only three had qualified so far. Bai Luochen inquired about any rankings, and David explained them, though Bai Luochen paid little attention and headed towards the magic test. Despite hearing that white demons could only reach the low demon rank, Bai Luochen attempted to touch the crystal. Gladiette, unimpressed by Bai Luochen's appearance, quickly assigned him the role of a normal laborer. A large black demon tried to drag him away, but Bai Luochen resisted and continued to reach for the crystal. Gladiette could only curse after witnessing something bright. The whole room was shining brightly, and Gladiette began to sweat. He couldn't believe his eyes when he saw the crystal looking like a rainbow, and even David seemed surprised. Bai Luochen was curious about what was happening. Gladiate then instructed him to let go, and Bai Luochen immediately considered eliminating all witnesses. However, Gladiate started insulting him, calling him trash because Bai Luochen had no magical power despite having elemental affinity. As a result, Bai Luochen was assigned to the normal labor group. Other demons felt sorry for him because of his small horn. Bai Luochen was relieved that his secret was not exposed, but he felt angry for a different reason. Meanwhile, David had reached the maximum level of elemental affinity and had a magic level of 15, making him an intermediate chaos demon. Everyone praised David, including Bai Luochen. Even though Gladiate had praised David, he was secretly plotting to get rid of him as David posed a threat to his position. Gladiate slyly offered David a job in the inner house, making David thrilled. Despite expressing good wishes, Gladiate's true intention to undermine David was evident to Bai Luochen. In an attempt to intervene, Bai Luochen tried fortune-telling, but it only angered Gladiate. Furious, Gladiate commanded a massive demon to drive Bai Luochen away, although Bai Luochen hesitated due to his awareness of his own strength. Afterward, the regular workers had to chop 500 pieces of firewood each. If they didn't meet their quota, they wouldn't get any food, and everyone begged for mercy. Gladiate told them to stop complaining and start working. Bai Luochen could hear the cries of the other demons. He then picked up an axe and confirmed the task once again with Gladiate. Suddenly, someone told them to stop. It was the head maid of Wilton Manor, Su Fang Weila, who said that the firewood quota had already been met. She announced that the laborers would now be supervised by the maid team. Gladiate explained that he was just teaching the workers some lessons, but Su Fang Weila insisted it was no longer the concern of the labor department. Gladiate then agreed to leave, stating that he worked in the inner house. It turned out that Su Fang Weila always supported the lowborn workers. 
As he signed up, Bai Lochen learned about the head maid, and another maid explained her role. Bai Lochen then called out to her and offered to chop the wood alone. Su Fang Weila explained that Gladiette wanted them to chop an extraordinary wood and showed them the tree monster the maids were trying to tie down. She said their young lady had been hunting a lot, and other laborers exclaimed that the monster was called a demon vine. As they wondered how to chop it down, an axe split the monster in half, and Bai Luochen wondered if there were more. Su Fang Weila looked impressed and asked if Bai Luochen could share the burden. Bai Luochen pointed out that the others could die, and he wanted to use the chance to earn some spirit energy with his firewood count. He then suggested a competition, and Su Fang Weila got her own axe. The two mercilessly chopped the demon vines, and the others were scared to see such a sight. The two soon had mountains of firewood behind them, and Bai Luochen claimed the last count, making it his 501st firewood. He said he won, and Su Fang Weila came over laughing. She took his axe, split it into two, and said she now had her 502nd firewood. She mentioned that the axe handle was also made of demon vine, reminding Bai Luochen that she was the head maid. Demon Waifu was really competitive, after that she told everyone to leave for dinner. Bai Luochen looked around and noticed how eerie the trees were. He wondered how Nalan Duoduo was doing. Meanwhile, Nalan Duoduo, the mentioned disciple, was currently confronting a massive demon somewhere. Despite being in her transformed state, Nalan Duoduo was heavily injured. She skillfully evaded an attack from the monster but found herself in a moment of carelessness. Her bracelet alarmed her about the high danger level in her surroundings, and recommended using a healing item. However, Nalan Duoduo chose to disregard its advice as she was pushing herself to the limits during her training. As the monster attempted to devour Nalan Duoduo, she activated a special technique and skillfully avoided the attack. The technique not only healed her injuries but also converted spiritual energy into a demonic element. Grateful that it happened just in time, she utilized the tie-in silk rope to counterattack the monster. The threads effortlessly sliced through the monster, and Nalan Duoduo took a moment to reflect on the battle. She was thankful that Manman had taught her a technique that didn't rely on spiritual energy. Manman had imparted the Chiman technique, which Nalan Duoduo had personally cultivated. Proud of her own abilities, she asked the guide for something to restore her power. However, there was an error, and everything restarted. Then, a lizard monster appeared and attacked Nalan Duoduo. The lizard chomped off her head, leaving only her clothes in front of it. Luckily, she managed to teleport nearby and hide using Chimen. However, using this technique twice had already left her tired. The lizard monster eventually found her. From a distance, an upper-ranked demon observed and hoped that Nalan Duoduo could hold on as she prepared to attack. Nalan Duoduo transformed again to dodge the lizard's attacks and urgently urged the guide to hurry up. But the progress was slow. The lizard monster attacked once more, managing to bite off a part of her wings. In frustration, the lizard monster took a deep breath and unleashed a laser beam towards Nalan Duoduo. Fortunately, she remained safe due to Bai Luochen's puppet, which deactivated its shield since no malice was detected. It was then that Nalan Duoduo noticed that the lizard's upper half had been blown off. The demon approached Nalan Duoduo and asked if she was okay. Nalan Duoduo felt puzzled when the demon referred to her as a friend. The demon praised her bravery for defeating a dragon puppet and assumed she was with Shaja. Not understanding, Nalan Duoduo asked who Shaja were. The demon explained they're those who help fight the juicy people. Grateful for Nalan Duoduo getting rid of the lizard monster that took her family, the demon thanked her. They noticed they both had purple wings and wondered if they shared ancestry. Nalan Duoduo wondered if the demon had hidden motives for getting close suddenly. She pretended to be lost and asked for directions to a nearby city. The demon offered to lead her to the Shaja capital. Introducing herself as Shaika, the demon learned Nalan Duoduo's name as Sun Duoduo. Not long after, the two reached New Shaja City, which had been constructed underground with tunnels. A girl named Aisha greeted Shaika upon her return, inquiring if she had located her parents. Shaika then shared that her parents had sided with their lord and left behind a book for her. Aisha expressed gratitude, and the two parted ways. Nalan Duoduo later confirmed that Aisha's parents had passed away and Shaika explained that the Jew clan's dragon puppets were responsible. Shaika was informed that the dragon puppeteer had awakened, prompting her to ask Nalan Duoduo to accompany her. In a room, there was another demon tied up, covered in blood. Shaika had started questioning the prisoner, but the dragon puppeteer just mocked her. Shaika slapped him and sternly asked for information. The man then declared that he used to be a noble juicy warrior, and his mission was to force everyone out of their promised land for their war god to descend. As he continued threatening Shaika's people, she threw a punch, ending the dragon puppeteer's life. 
she apologized to Nalan Duoduo for the gruesome sight. With an upcoming war, Shaika offered Nalan Duoduo some accommodations, and she had no choice but to agree. In the demon world's Farron Island, a strange lump of flesh was about to burst. It was the sea monster from earlier, and Chang Xiaoliu was attempting to control it. While she kept biting the monster, she unexpectedly sprouted demon horns and wings. The guide mentioned that her spiritual power had transformed into demonic power. Despite this revelation, she paid no attention and kept attacking the sea monster. Eventually, the monster transformed into a little girl and began crying loudly. Chang Xiaoyu had noticed a strange presence and saw a masked demon leading their leader to the location. After sensing a sudden surge of magic, wondering what their business was, Chang Xiaoyu asked. The woman froze upon noticing their legendary ancient deity, Kanara. The leader of the Klein Chush, Lin Merlin, then grabbed a small girl who seemed confused. Lin Merlin celebrated with her followers, declaring that their deity had finally arrived. Chang Xiao Liu was confused about what was happening. Lin Merlin, like a doting mother, called the little girl Lady Nana, and started showering her with affection because Nana was cute and small. A follower mentioned that another person also looked like Lady Nana. Lin Merlin handed Nana to others, and Chang Xiao Liu found the situation strange. Suddenly Lin Merlin appeared behind her and assumed that Chang Xiao Liu was Nana's sister named Lulu. Despite Chang Xiao Liu's protest that she was an ancestor, Lin Merlin wasn't listening. Angered, Chang Xiao Liu sent her flying with a punch, but it seemed like Lin Merlin enjoyed being treated that way. All of a sudden Lin Merlin noticed that Nana had been acting aggressively towards Chang Xiao Liu. Despite this, they continued to assume that the two were sisters based on their appearance. Chang Xiao Liu soon realized what was going on. Nana began urging them to harm Chang Xiao Liu, but they couldn't understand her language. Seizing the opportunity, Chang Xiao Liu smirked and took control of the situation. She declared that the little one was just hungry. Lin Merlin and the rest believed her. Chang Xiao Liu then instructed Nana to go along with the act. Lin Merlin then directed the others to prepare a feast. After the events at Kanara Temple, many ingredients had been prepared. Chang Xiao Liu couldn't believe that the church had been situated in a cave, and Lin Melrin took it as a compliment. She was pleased that the sisters had descended after a thousand years. Suddenly, a gift arrived, and Chang Xiao Liu broke into a cold sweat upon seeing it. It was the statue of their lord Kanara. The two outsiders were confused, and Chang Xiao Liu wondered if the statue had to do with Nana. Lin Merlin then told her to look at the statue's chest, pointing out that it was the same as Nana's and Chang Xiao Liu's flat chest. Angry, Chang Xiao Liu threw a punch since they were using beasts to recognize people. She then glared at Nana and hugged her claiming that it would be safer if she stuck with her. Lin Merlin was happy to see a sisterly bond forming in front of her. At that moment, a follower mentioned that the great wealth was ready. Lin Merlin then guided the two to a place before they had their meal. She revealed a mimic box that swiftly snatched Nana with its tongue. Chang Xiaoyu told Lin Merlin to release Nana, but Lin Merlin assured her that Box Kun wouldn't harm Nana. Box Kun then spat out Nana, now dressed in the same uniform as the statue. Did I just see Shigure Ui? Nana was puzzled by what was happening, and Box Kun cheered for her with glow sticks. Nana took a deep breath and struck a heart pose. Man, this really looks like a Shigure Wii imitation. Suddenly, the cave transformed into a concert venue. Chang Xiao Liu couldn't believe that Nana got into character. Nana smirked, realizing she had gained followers. Lin Merlin announced the beginning of the Divine Feast with dancing and singing. At that moment, their scholar appeared and reported that they could now carry out their plans as their Kanara had already descended. He said the cannon was ready, and Lin Merlin approved of going out after the feast to spread the word about their Lord Kanara. Meanwhile, at an experiment field owned by the Holy Demon Empire, a massive red rock sandworm emerged from the desert ground. A robot aimed its weapon at the sandworm and instantly took it down with a laser beam. The pilot countered the shot, using a whip to extract a magic crystal from the sandworm. She announced they had already gathered enough magic crystals. Doug, a first-class demon and a senior magical puppet pilot, mentioned that they had been working continuously for five days, and their robots were on the verge of giving up. Just then, another robot, piloted by her sister, advised her to follow their leader's orders. The military had recently prioritized airships, and if they didn't show results soon, the Magical Warrior Puppet Project would be dissolved. Kate explained this to Daug. Their leader, Rokoko, emphasized the need to prove the validity of their energy conversions for power supply. If they could verify their claim, they would receive more military resources. Daug had reported his concern that they were only encountering sandworms and nothing else. 
Kate agreed, as the experiment field was supposed to be home to various deadly magical creatures. Suddenly, the weather turned bad, and a sandstorm brewed nearby, accompanied by hurricanes. The squad found the situation strange, and Kate suggested retreating. However, Rococo was adamant about avoiding further delays in their project. She reminded the siblings that their goal was to find the desert's lord, a mighty creature called the Rock Emperor Worm. Rococo didn't mind success or failure and told the siblings to decide. Ultimately, Doug and Kate chose to follow Rococo as they navigated the desert amidst the sandstorm and hurricanes. Suddenly, they stumbled upon a giant's shadow, but Rococo insisted it was just a mirage. However, it turned out to be one of Bai Luochen's puppets with Zeeling on its shoulder, desperately calling for help. She kept calling until she ended up coughing in some sand, confused about her whereabouts. As soon as she landed, she was attacked, but Bai Luochen's puppet came to her rescue. The demon world proved to be a terrifying experience, leaving Zeeling in tears. In the midst of this, another attack came, and the puppet skillfully blocked it. Doug couldn't believe the puppet remained unharmed. Rokoko commanded to launch another attack, but she felt a sense of foreboding. Kate then informed them that someone was on the giant's shoulder. Zi Ling reassured them that she meant no harm and just sought a way out of the desert. Rokoko, however, shivered at the sight of Zi Ling and ordered yet another attack, despite sensing something ominous. The puppet, once again, successfully intercepted the attack. Rokoko had exclaimed that the white demon on the giant's shoulder might have been someone from the Rebel Alliance. She ordered the siblings to switch to close combat, and the three fired off some smoke screens. Tsai Ling then hid in a safer spot on the puppet. The squad started their close combat, but the puppet easily neutralized their melee weapons by grabbing and smashing them. Another attack came, but the puppet effortlessly cut off the robot's limbs like butter with its hand chops. Rokoko felt helpless and sat on the ground. She couldn't believe such a powerful entity came from the Rebel Alliance. She cried as her family's efforts seemed to be in vain. Rokoko then attempted to take out the puppet even if it meant her own demise. She fired a huge laser beam, but the puppet remained unscathed. Tsai Ling was impressed that they were able to damage the clothes of Bai Luochen's puppet. Even the monsters around them were obliterated. The robot's cockpit opened, and Rokoko appeared all shriveled like an old woman. Zi Ling was relieved that Rokoko's soul was still fresh. She asked her not to disappoint her since she needed information. Analyzing Rokoko's soul, Zi Ling found her interesting and promised to fulfill Rokoko's unfinished ambition. Zi Ling then took over Rokoko's body using a soul and skin snatching technique. A week ago, Bai Luochen felt right at home after clearing heaps of demon vines. Su Fengwela scolded him, saying he'd already chopped enough for a year. During the stone material collection, Bai Luochen brought back a stone golem to meet his quota. He also joined in the maid's fishing activities and took care of the pets, especially the boxing-loving kangaroo monster. When it came to cleanup, Bai Luochen preferred burning everything, but that was just Su Fang Weila's dream. In reality, she was stressed by Bai Luochen's recent mischievous behavior. She couldn't believe someone could turn into a troublemaker in just a week, even in her dreams. Trying to make the day smoother, Su Fang Weila dressed up and went out to see what Bai Luochen was up to. Meanwhile, the troublemaker was busy reading the morning newspaper. The news articles showed Shaika being murdered for the third time, the Imperial Puppet Warrior project being restarted, and strange statues related to the Kanara cult appearing. All of them were related to Bai Luchen's disciples. While he read the news, Su Fang Weila came over and pinched his ear. She told him not to slack off in her office, but Bai Luchen exclaimed that his tasks were long over, and Su Fang Weila's lounge was the only place he could visit. Su Fang Weila couldn't believe his audacity since she would always clean up after his excessive results. Bai Luochen blamed her for not keeping up. Su Fang Weila tried to hand chop him, but Bai Luochen asked her not to be violent when not winning an argument. Su Fang Weila assumed that Bai Luochen thought his current tasks were easy. She then asked another maid named Funa to bring a set of maid uniforms. Bai Luochen, feeling worried, was informed by Su Fang Weila that he would be joining the maid corps and was given a maid uniform. Bai Luochen agreed to work but insisted on not wearing the frilly clothes. Su Fang Weila explained that the maid corps had a strict dress code and reminded Bai Luochen that he should feel fortunate for the opportunity, even as a lowly white demon. Annoyed, Bai Luochen pointed out that Su Fang Weila also had short horns. Funa feeling scared quickly escaped and Su Fang Weila instructed her to close the door. Su Fang Weila then demanded that Bai Luochen apologize and put on the uniform. Bai Luochen had refused, letting go of the uniform as Su Fang Weila snatched it away angrily. She was upset that such an important uniform was being tossed around carelessly. Seeing Su Fang Weila growing angrier, Bai Luochen likely activated his spiritual energy and asked if he could leave. He instructed a nearby cat to move away from the window, hinting at his intention to escape. 
Recognizing his attempt, Su Fang Weila leaped towards Bai Luochen to prevent him from leaving. In response, Bai Luochen tossed a talisman, stunning Su Fang Weila and causing her to fall on top of him. Briefly enjoying a moment of peace, Bai Luochen tried to slip away, leaving Su Fang Weila still unconscious. However, as he approached the front door, he sensed Su Fang Weila starting to wake up. She was furious that her orders had been disregarded and even had a paper thrown on her forehead. Outside the room, only Bai Luochen's pleas for mercy could be heard. Meanwhile, on the estate's farm, a group of maids found themselves under attack by a monstrous chicken. This creature, actually a large feathered earth dragon destined for dinner, was proving difficult to handle. It resembled something straight out of a JoJo series. Just as the maids were considering calling for help, a man's voice reassured them and swiftly sliced the dragon in half as he landed. Wearing maid attire, Bai Luochen stepped forward, declaring his intention to take charge. He calmly checked if the maids were unharmed, though his entrance was rather unimpressive for a protagonist. The girls had praised Bai Luochen for assisting them, but they found it odd that he was wearing maid clothes. He explained that he had lost a bet against the head maid, leading to his unusual attire. The maids then clarified that it was the first time a man had been allowed to join the maid corps. Originally, they were the estate's soldier team, and Su Fang Weila, in charge of the first trials involving men, was strict. The fact that Su Fang Weila gave Bai Luochen a maid outfit was a sign of appreciation. However, Bai Luochen couldn't believe that the demon world was dominated by females. When they reached the house to feed the pet, Bai Luochen couldn't understand why his talisman didn't work against Su Fang Weila. He attempted to check his attributes through the system, but it just kept loading. The maids, who were geared up for protection, questioned why Bai Luochen wasn't wearing any armor, especially since they were recent maids and wanted to avoid getting injured. Bai Luochen insisted that he was skilled at taking care of pets. Upon opening the door, Bai Luochen was startled by a threatening growl echoing in the area. He soon identified the source as Sanrik, his pet demon. Calmly, he lifted Sanrik by its horn, causing the maids to become frightened. Sanrik, in response, unleashed a deadly breath attack. The maids managed to take cover behind a steel plate while Bai Luochen remained out of sight. Unexpectedly, a hand emerged from the ground, attempting to grab Sanrik. Despite the demon pet's attempt to retaliate with the same breath attack, Bai Luochen intervened and stopped it. As the demon pet whined and fell unconscious, Bai Luochen slowly emerged from the hole he had created. The maids expressed their gratitude, but Bai Luochen dismissed it, stating that dealing with monsters was routine for the maid corps. The maids then shared that they were lagging behind the task force, which was preparing to extract magic crystals from the perilous depths of the abyss mine, teeming with dangerous monsters. They believed collaborating with the maid corps, led by Su Feng Weila, would be more effective. Bai Luochen suddenly understood the significance of what David had mentioned earlier. After leaving Sanrik's enclosure, they exited the pet house. That night, in the laborer's dormitory, a tired and battered David was carried to his room. The men who carried him claimed Gladiat had been making David work excessively before they left. David then talked about how he had seen the young lady, and Bai Luochen added that wedding candles would be seen soon. Bai Luochen then used a talisman to heal David. David had only come to the demon world to gather information about the soul sect, but various troublesome situations kept arising. When he attempted to use the system again, it wasn't functioning properly. While he pondered his next move, a spider watched him from behind. Outside, a maid noticed that Bai Luochen could also use talismans. The following morning in the back mountain area, a maid was chased by a demon vine. She fell and the monster was about to attack her. Suddenly it ran off, leaving the maid confused. An axe flew towards the demon vine, chopping it in half. Bai Luochen then called out to the maid, reminding her that the back mountain area was dangerous. She mentioned coming to meet Bai Luochen, who in turn, said he was the one she was looking for and questioned if she worked under Su Feng Weila. Bai Luochen doubted that a clumsy maid would be employed by the head maid. The maid explained that there was a task assigned to Bai Luochen by Su Feng Weila. Despite finding her suspicious, Bai Luochen offered to help. She informed him that they would ride a carriage, but he needed to be blindfolded. Bai Luochen questioned her role as a maid and reluctantly agreed to be guided. A red-skinned demon observed as Bai Luochen followed their puppeteer. The demon instructed the maid beside her to inform their comrades to be ready. The familiar brown-haired maid worried that their cover might be blown since Bai Luochen was sharp. The red demon insisted that any man would fall for the clumsy type, and the puppeteer they sent was the best at infiltrating the estate. Meanwhile, Su Feng Weila was delighted that Bai Luochen hadn't been causing any trouble recently. Surprisingly, the other maids were also relaxing in the lounge, which made Su Feng Weila wonder why they were free at 3 in the afternoon. The girls then explained that their tasks had become easier lately because Bai Luochen had been helping. 
Sufangwela scolded them for relying on a male demon to handle everything. She then called for the sleepy Feng to check on Bai Luochen. Feng pulled out a notebook and discovered that the gatekeeper had reported Bai Luochen leaving for the abyss mine. The maids trembled at the thought of the dangerous mine. Su Fang Weila couldn't believe Bai Luochen had been taken away without informing her. She decided to ignore it for now, trusting that he would return due to their agreement. The maids gathered in front of her, expressing their concerns for the weaker male member of their group. They continued to plead until Su Fang Weila agreed to go to the Abyss Mine, wanting to find out who had the audacity to take someone under her command. On the flip side, Bai Luochen had been guided to a mountaintop, a surprisingly secretive entrance to a mine. While the maid explained, Bai Luochen had already approached the entrance. An inebriated old man was at the entrance, and Bai Luochen woke him up. The old man then guided them to the elevator, instructing the maid to return to the estate. He cautioned Bai Luochen about the instability and potential difficulties ahead, and the elevator descended. As they approached the surface, Bai Luochen spotted something flying towards them. It turned out to be a mid-level abyssal bird, known for preying on people using elevators. Bai Luochen wondered if these creatures were the problem the old man had mentioned. He swiftly slashed the monster, causing it to plummet from the sky. As more of them approached, Bai Luochen sought a solution from the old man. The old man reached into his bag, and in no time, unleashed flames from the elevator. He had used a special grass that mimicked a dragon's breath when ignited. Bai Luochen had asked about their current depth, and the old man assured him they would soon reach the stronghold. Realizing that the Abyss Mine posed the same danger level as Kang Wu Mountains, Bai Luochen decided to search for valuable items later. The elevator stopped, leaving Bai Luochen curious about the stronghold's location. The old man mentioned it was still five kilometers away and reassured that someone would pick them up. While waiting, Bai Luochen spotted a bug-like monster. The old man explained that these creatures served as security for the stronghold, as long as they were supplied with white magic. Some laborers were fleeing from one of the bugs. Bai Luochen noticed something and set off on his own. Meanwhile, David found himself being chased by one of the bugs. He attempted to use earth magic to block it, resulting in an explosion. To his surprise, Bai Luochen stood on top of the defeated bug. David reminded him not to die since he hadn't attended his wedding yet. Tavid had wondered why Bai Luochen approached him while he was doing maid work. Bai Luochen insisted he was just taking a walk. Recalling that David had used magic earlier, David explained it was earth magic, mainly used for construction. Bai Luochen suggested they shouldn't linger as they could become bug food. Despite the warning, David pointed out a massive worm monster behind Bai Luochen. Bai Luochen, unfazed, continued urging David to join the Maid Corps. The monster attacked, prompting Bai Luochen to activate a talisman. Unfortunately, Bai Luochen ended up inside the monster's mouth, causing concern for David. The bug exploded, scattering its flesh, but Bai Luochen continued discussing the Maid Corps. David, curious about Bai Luochen's use of magic, questioned him. Bai Luochen insisted it wasn't magic and asked if David knew about cultivation. Since David was unfamiliar, Bai Luochen promised to explain later after dealing with the remaining bug. Meanwhile, a red demon reported that their sacrifice to the abyssal ant had survived. Mapuchiro, an upper-ranked demon, growled in annoyance and demanded food and women to soothe his anger. His subordinate expressed concern, fearing calamity because the sacrifice had not been successful. Mapuchiro dismissed it, stating it wasn't a big deal. He declared that he would personally use the sacrifice as food for the bugs. He then instructed his men to arrange five female white demons before his return. With that, he leaped off from his tower. On the flip side, Bai Luochen collected extra bugs for David to practice with. David attempted a cultivation technique but stumbled over the words. The bugs ended up exploding, and David was thrilled that it actually worked. However, the celebration was short-lived, as Mapuchiro made a superhero landing, crushing the bugs in the process. Bai Luochen, who was teaching David the technique, stepped in to block Mapuchiro's attack. Mapuchiro was astonished that a white demon could intercept his strike. Bai Luochen then proposed that David should alter his accent before aspiring to become a cultivation immortal. As Bai Luochen landed, Mapuchiro couldn't help but wonder if he had rebelled, but David quickly denied it. Bai Luochen continued giving a lecture until he approached Mapuchiro, asking if he was the boss in the area. Mapuchiro was surprised that a rebel was speaking the official language. Bai Luochen clarified that he wasn't a rebel, and explained that he had come to convince his friend to join the Maid Corps instead. He suggested Mapuchiro talk to Su Feng Weila, and Mapuchiro now understood why Bai Luochen had a foul mouth. However, he would only let David leave if he left his head behind. Pai Luochen successfully blocked Mapuchiro's attack again, and wondered if Mapuchiro wasn't scared of Su Feng Weila. 
Mapochiro confidently declared his invincibility against Su Feng Weila and invited Bai Luchin to bring her over as he casually ate some mushrooms. Bai Luchin was impressed that someone wasn't afraid of his boss. David then explained that Mapochiro could become stronger and crazier by consuming a giant mushroom. Suddenly, Mapochiro went berserk and used a high-tier magic to cause an earthquake. The old man from earlier chuckled and suggested Mapuchiro end things quickly, as they knew Su Feng Weila's attitude towards her subordinates. The old man, known as Thousand Faces, revealed himself as a middle-ranked demon from the rebel camp. He mentioned sacrificial rituals, illegal cultivation of giant mushrooms, and necromancy occurring in the Abyss Mine, expressing concern about a possible connection to the lunatic cult from the legendary Farron Islands. As Thousand Faces spoke, a zombie behind him was turned into mush by another member of the rebel camp, Melt, a lower-ranked demon. She criticized Thousand Faces for talking to a random skull all the time, and questioned the reliability of their target. Thousand Faces replied that it depended on the outcome of the fight. In the depths of the Abyss Mine, Su Feng Weila roamed around with a hand-drawn portrait, searching for Bai Luochen. A guard mentioned that the elevator was out of order for the day, but Su Feng Weila had doubts. The guard insisted it was under scheduled maintenance, and no one should have descended for the day. Su Feng Weila interrogated the guard further. She requested the logs and the guard reluctantly handed them over. While inspecting the records from a pillar managed by Mapochiro, she noticed reports of numerous white demons being either dead or missing. She wondered why the Ministry of Internal Affairs was unaware of this. Recalling that the mine was overseen by Gradit, she decided to go alone. She planned to visit the first stronghold to check if Bai Luochen was there. As the guard worried about how to report what had happened, a person descended the stairs. It turned out to be Lucy, the young lady of Wilton Manor, who was an upper-ranked demon. She approached the guard after hearing the shouting and inquired about the situation. The guard attempted to explain that someone had jumped, but she began hyperventilating. Lucy, concerned, instructed her maid Yezi to assist the overwhelmed guard. After some calming breaths, the guard managed to convey that Su Feng Weila had jumped from the window. Lucy and the others felt relieved upon learning it was Su Feng Weila. Lucy assured the guard not to worry, emphasizing that Su Feng Weila was the strongest demon around. Yezi requested the elevator to the 31st stronghold, and the guard confirmed that it was ready. Lucy decided to leave her other maid, Yi Ching, behind as she and Yezi descended to observe. The two entered the elevator and went down. Meanwhile, Mapachiro was all tied up and David was dragging him while discussing the termination of David's work contract. Suddenly, they noticed some people nearby. David asked for medical help for Mapuchiro. The two individuals were Melt and Thousand Faces. Melt quickly shot acid at Mapuchiro, instantly melting the demon. Bai Luchin advised David not to panic. Thousand Faces expressed disappointment that he and Bai Luchin didn't have enough time to get to know each other. Bai Luchin wondered why they took out Mapuchiro instead of simply opening the door. Thousand Faces explained that nobody was inside, and only he and Melt were in the area. David worried about his colleagues. Thousand Faces assured him that the other white demons had been sent elsewhere. Their organization only targeted evil people and black demons who had committed crimes, which was why they took out Mapakiro. David realized that the old man was from the rebel group. Thousand Faces explained that the group aimed to free all white demons from oppression, justifying Mapakiro's death. He offered Bai Luchin a chance to join them, but said they could still be friends if he chose otherwise. David had respected the resistance movement among the white demons. Bai Luchin found it admirable, but was put off by seeing them in hiding. He then applied a cultivation technique on the two demons. Thousand faces started bubbling while Melt's head exploded. Melt got angry and threatened Bai Luochen. Thousand faces told her to stop and clarified that it wasn't a magical attack. She then giggled and formally introduced herself as Melt, in charge of the stronghold. She assured Bai Luochen that they meant no harm. However, Bai Luochen was busy receiving criticism from David for forcibly removing women's clothes. Bai Luochen wondered why they had invited him to come. Thousand Faces then explained that they were from the Maid Corps, seeking his impressions. She added that they also needed help investigating something and asked Melt to assist. Melt melted a hole in the iron door, and Thousand Faces explained that everyone they murdered in the stronghold turned into zombies. Although decapitation would normally take out a zombie, the ones in the stronghold could still move afterward. According to their allied mages, it wasn't necromancy magic, but a pathological change in their souls that could spread like a virus to others. They didn't have a way to stop the spreading at the time. An order was given to dispose of corpses in the 31st stronghold, and it might have meant dealing with zombies. She asked Melt to seal the door back. David then realized why many of his colleagues had been getting sick lately. 
Thousand Faces then informed Vi Lucian that the virus might not only infect demons, but also demonic creatures. Since it could be dangerous when these creatures pour out later, she wanted to ask for his help with the investigation. Vi Lucian didn't have a choice but to agree, now that they were surrounded by demonic creatures. Meanwhile, a demonic creature had opened its mouth wide and fired off a laser beam, much like Godzilla. Everything in front of it got destroyed, and it roared, asserting its dominance. Shika called Nalan Duoduo, who, in turn, witnessed the chaotic scene. The Godzilla wannabe was then sliced in half by Nalan Duoduo, with a casual attack using her wings. She hovered in the air, wings spread wide, utilizing the indigenous magic she had learned to turn her wings into weapons. Shika inquired about an update, and Nalan Duoduo expressed that things were not looking good. She mentioned the evil nature of the array but noted that her attacks could pass through it. The sky seemed unsettled, and Nalan Duoduo sensed something dangerous above. Shika questioned if Nalan Duoduo couldn't use her magic, and Nalan Duoduo explained that it was immortal arts. She emphasized that if her master were present, the juicy people in their country would have already perished. To reassure Shika, she clarified that her master wasn't evil. Shika, intrigued by the strength of Nalan Duoduo's master, wondered if he could eliminate the monster before them. Nalan Duoduo then scanned the skies and spotted the Empire's Griffin Corps. They had brought along a nuke capable of flattening the area. Shika, angered by the Empire's claim of neutrality while supporting the Juicy Race, labeled them the true monsters. Nalan Duoduo reminded Shika that their mission was to gather resources only, and Shika assured her that she was taking responsibility for it. A halo-like thing suddenly appeared above Shika's head, and her wings got five times bigger. She shot off like a jet, creating a powerful gust of wind that sent Nalan Duoduo flying sideways. Nalan Duoduo attempted to halt her, but Shika kept soaring upward. The array device responded by launching something to pursue Shika. All the devices attacked Shika, capturing her. Nalan Duoduo looked up and saw Shika trapped by a triangular seal. Shika then muttered something, and the seal burst, causing the array devices to shatter. Shilka descended in a new form resembling a Valkyrie, surrounded by lightning. She readied her sword and swiftly flew towards the griffins. She cut down the monsters quickly, inadvertently triggering the nukes. They exploded in the sky, leaving Nalan Duoduo to watch helplessly. Shilka then fell from the thick clouds and Nalan Duoduo rushed to her rescue. She promptly used her healing talisman on Shailka, but Shailka insisted on saving the talismans for other warriors. Nalan Duoduo, surprised, mentioned having plenty of talismans. Shailka asked her to bring her back and slowly closed her eyes. Nalan Duoduo desperately tried to wake Shailka up. Later in Shailka's room, Nalan Duoduo was upset because she had worried about Shailka's sudden fainting. Shailka apologized, explaining that it happened because she overused her power. Grateful for Nalan Duoduo's assistance with their group, Shika wondered how they could repay her. Nalan Duoduo said it was okay, mentioning that her master believed doing good deeds could balance out bad ones. However, she expressed curiosity about Shika's second form and its power, which matched her holy talisman. Shika admitted she couldn't teach that, and Nalan Duoduo understood. As Nalan Duoduo was leaving, Shika thanked her. Outside the room, Aisha gave Nalan Duoduo a flower wreath as a gift for the angel. Nalan Duoduo informed her that Shika was still resting, but Aisha clarified that the flower was for Nalan Duoduo herself. Aisha revealed that Nalan Duoduo would become the new angel because Shika would die soon. This news shocked Nalan Duoduo. Shortly after, Nalan Duoduo broke into a hidden location. She couldn't believe that the inheritance of angels was concealed deep underground. Landing in front of a temple, she opened a massive door and found various statues of those who served as angels. Remembering Aisha's words about Shika stepping down in three days, Nalan Duoduo realized she was the strongest candidate to replace her. Moreover, Aisha had mentioned that when an angel reached the age of 17, they would sacrifice their body to the Holy Spirit Flame, blessing their lands and race. Nalan Duoduo paused in front of an altar, expressing her doubts about the human sacrifice ritual. Using her poison, she melted the chain sealing a book, and upon opening it, she was shocked to discover something familiar the mystical arts of divination. That night, a monster tried to attack a person with wings, but its head suddenly exploded. Shika was the one who did it, but she remained in good condition. Nalan Duoduo was questioning some juicy puppeteers on the ground. After Shika cleared out the dragons, she joined Nalan Duoduo, who was interrogating them. Shika gave Nalan Duoduo some food and apologized for not being able to cook, as creating fire would reveal their location. Nalan Duoduo was okay with it, but wondered why they had to charge recklessly into the enemy front lines. She noticed that Shika was still injured from the last fight, 
Shaika dismissed it, wiped her nosebleed, and claimed it was nothing. Her goal for the night was to rescue the hostages alone. Nalan Duoduo tried to help, but Shaika ordered her to stay back. Shaika thanked Nalan Duoduo and left with a sad expression. Nalan Duoduo wondered if things would work out after she made some modifications to the mystical arts of divination. A juicy puppeteer then freed his mouth and exclaimed that the land would be flattened to the ground. At the Shaja Eastern Separation Wall, alarms blared through the night. A demon who had just finished some business wondered about the commotion. Suddenly, purple feathers started falling from the sky, confusing the demon. As he realized there was an intruder, the demon was sliced in half and Shaika appeared in her transformed state. In the camp, panic spread as the news of a terrorist reached everyone. Juicy's Holy Defense Force confronted Shaika. She couldn't believe they were labeled terrorists. A soldier reported that all the dragons and their puppeteers had been murdered. The captain wondered how Shaika bypassed their magic nullification, suspecting a connection to the legendary angel inheritance. He ordered his men to make Shaika use up her lifespan and strength. Shaika, confident in her abilities, declared she had more than enough strength to defeat everyone. She requested a final battle and charged toward the soldiers. The area exploded as if a nuke had been dropped. Juicy soldiers were burnt, and despite the devastation, the captain still had the energy to activate their magical puppet to raise Shaja to the ground. On the other hand, Shaika remained unhurt but panted heavily, leaning on her sword for support. At that moment, a nearby wall exploded, revealing a robot. Shaika felt relieved that she witnessed the Empire's secret weapon just before her potential demise. Abruptly, she coughed up blood, and Nalan Duoduo was relieved that she arrived in the nick of time. Shaika was confused when Nalan Duoduo attacked her. Wondering why, she noticed her transformation was being reversed. After it was undone, she braced herself for the expected repercussions. Despite being aware that it was her fate, Shaika suddenly became scared of dying. As she fell to the ground, Nalan Duoduo wrapped her with threads, saving her from the robot's exploding talisman attack. Pulling Shaika up, she shielded her from the ensuing explosion. Afterward, Nalan Duoduo offered Shaika something to eat, but Shaika refused. Suddenly, the robot unleashed a lightning shadow talisman. Nalan Duoduo swiftly avoided the attack, then placed a silkworm on her mouth. Administering it to Shaika using her mouth, she took quick action to help her. Three days ago, Nalan Duoduo discovered the secret of the angel inheritance. This knowledge meant that unlocking the nodes would unleash a more potent power, but it would put a significant strain on the body. The process of selecting an angel merely involved finding someone capable of enduring this power, while the weaker ones would have their magic energy cycle disrupted. Realizing that Shaika had only three days left to live, Nalan Duoduo found the secret arts of energy cycling strangely familiar. She decided to experiment with it herself, triggering an unexpected reaction. The underground area experienced a sudden earthquake, causing concern and panic among the people. Undeterred, Nalan Duoduo persisted, recalling the teachings of her senior sister, Manmen. Manmen's mystical arts were centered around using the outer eight gates, but the angel's secret involved opening the inner eight gates. Understanding this distinction, Nalan Duoduo believed she could make a difference. With a plan in mind, she decided to accompany Shaika on her final mission. In the present, Nalan Duoduo celebrated when she saw the mystical arts of divination working. However, they were still under attack by the Empire's robot. The robot used a strength talisman causing a nearby wall to explode into pieces. Nalan Duoduo wondered why talismans were appearing in the demon world, and why their power was so massive. Struggling to think clearly amidst the attack, Nalan Duoduo took another silkworm from her remaining supply. With a few left, she pondered if she could call for her master. Just as the robot attempted another attack, Nalan Duoduo screamed Shaika's name loudly. A huge explosion followed, revealing Shaika flying with Nalan Duoduo in her arms. Shaika exclaimed that she was filled with strength from the magic Nalan Duoduo transferred to her. Nalan Duoduo corrected her, stating it was immortal arts and her second specialty. After landing, Shaika asked Nalan Duoduo to leave things to her. As Shaika took charge, Nalan Duoduo was relieved that she could finally take a break. Shaika had charged towards the robot, unleashing the power of mystical arts to create a spiritual sword. With a swift dash, she managed to sever one of the robot's arms. She noticed that the overwhelming power that had previously tormented her was now in harmony. Realizing it was because of Nalan Duoduo's mystical art of divination, the robot retaliated with an energy cannon, but Shaika skillfully dodged the attack. Employing another mystical art, she skillfully chopped the robot into pieces. Seeing the robot explode, Shaika felt relieved that the ordeal was finally over. Nalan Duoduo flew towards Shaika, greeting her with a happy birthday. She explained that she had searched for a special flower. 
which Shaika accepted with an embarrassed demeanor. Nalan Duo Duo attempted to share the flower's meaning in Shaja, but Shaika's attention was elsewhere. Instead, Nalan Duo Duo encouraged Shaika to make a wish. Shaika expressed her wish for Shaja's prosperity. The two then flew back home together. Nalan Duo Duo playfully warned Shaika to hurry if she didn't want to end up attending her own funeral. Thanks for watching. If you would like to see the next part, comment below.